My name is Ahmed, and welcome to Dustin Tribe. Since 2012, the original Muslim adventure community. This is our podcast, a production of the Outlander Media Cooperative. We share reflections here, and we sometimes tell stories, and we invite you to learn more at www.dustintribe.com. Every morning at Camp One, we take the long walk to the goat paddock. We've got a bucket full of grass pellets, some kibble for the dog, and a couple bottles of warmed milk for the goat kids. It's cool outside, alive with creek burble and bird song. It's hard to get up, but there is rarely a morning outside that our bleary mind fog does not give way to invigorated gratitude. Now, the animals do not immediately see us coming. They are quiet, and if we don't snap a twig along the way, we might even see the younger goats huddled together, settled onto their haunches and chewing their cud. The older goats will be found pacing slowly, nibbling what's left of the dewy grass as our dog patrols the fence line. But this bucolic scene changes once we've been spotted. It might be a bleat or a woof, depending on who sees us first, but once the word is out, it spreads like wildfire. Our dog and the younger goats, well, they charge the gates. The older goats... They jog back and forth, their collar bells all a tankle. Unable to contain their excitement, some will even rise up against others in head-butting dominance displays as if to make sure that everyone knows who's got first dibs. As we get closer to the gate, our Anatolian shepherd, his name is A.D., he'll start to chase off any animals that might be crowding our entry. Now, he means well, but he's often violently enthusiastic in the execution of his crowd control duties, mouthing the neck of the alpha doe, tugging at her collar and dragging her all over the place. But it works, and we slip into the paddock. At that point, we are immediately surrounded by a bleating frenzy of hungry goats, all jostling for position as we dump the feed across several containers. It's not uncommon for an animal to put us off balance or even to rear up and knock the bucket right out of our hands, but something amazing happens once all the feed has been distributed. Everything goes quiet again. Each animal finds a spot. And there is only the contented munching of compressed timothy grass and alfalfa punctuated by the scrape and crunch of A.D. nosing his bowl of kibble And all is well, at least for a few moments. As the food disappears into their gullets, a sense of scarcity develops. The dominant goats once again assert themselves with a clacking of horns, and there is some rushing about as subordinates squabble for any remaining dust. Watching and listening, we think about how we manage our own needs. There's a certain restlessness that attends desire, and if it feels to us that our wants are just within our grasp, or perhaps slipping away from it, then we might feel this even more acutely. Hmm. The idea of having a brand new house in an impossibly beautiful location, well, that's the passive stuff of fantasy for many of us. We don't lose sleep over the matter, but how would it feel if a rich uncle suddenly passes? and we inherit the means to procure our dreams. And then what if we find that house in that place, only to learn that there are ten other people bidding on the same property? Under those circumstances, we may not sleep at all. It seems to us that the intensity of our desire is linked to our perceived probability of attainment. The goats are hungry before they see us, but they're also quiet, relaxed, and seemingly content. It's not until they sense the possibility of food that they lose their minds. Now, perhaps this offers insight into the tropes of the miserable rich and the jovial poor. We're all familiar with the stories of people who seem to have it all, beauty, 
wealth, talent, notoriety, and we know how their parable tragically ends in drug abuse, debauchery, and even suicide. Now, if our goats are to be trusted, maybe it's because everything they ever wanted was now immediately attainable and Far from palliating their desire like the rattle of the feed bucket, everything was made so much more intense. Modest satisfaction gives way to frenzied acquisition, and if there's any truth to this, the restlessness of that unquenchable longing, well, that might understandably warrant self-medication. And as they dose themselves into oblivion, some barefoot wretch in third world squalor is banging away on a rusty oil drum and singing about nothing to nobody because he cannot contain his joy. And while he wants all the things that people want, he's never had a real shot at any of it. And this is not the tragedy that we might imagine. His contentment, well, that's a byproduct of his resignation. Through the latter, he is blind to possibilities beyond the very moment that he is in. This is the placid cud-chewing of the hungry goat, where the desire for food is forgotten in the warmth of the flock. For many of us, this is the unmet need behind all desire, connection and community. Yes, every beast must have its share of the essentials, food, water, shelter, but only a bit of each. More is not better, and worse than more is the prospect of it. The prophet said, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, mouthfuls sufficient to keep his back straight, that's enough for the son of Adam. That's in the collection of traditions recorded by Imam Tirmidhi. In the company of others similarly resigned to privation, we will not likely want any more than is necessary. Muslims who observe Ramadan will testify to this and to the comparative difficulty of trying to fast on one's own. But what is missed, however, is the way in which we willingly depart from or dismiss the importance of our connection to these people of resignation. We instead invest in the illusion of attainment, and we suffer the consequences of a hunger unleashed. We do this every time we pick up our phones and scroll through our social media feeds. And there it is. It's all right there at our very fingertips. Delicious food, tropical getaways, the teasing smiles and gyrations of the young and the beautiful. We lose our minds at the possibilities. We want all of it, more of it, an endless supply of it. And what's more, all of it is promised to us. We only need to buy this product or register for that course or attend the other events. Do what we do and you'll have what we have. This is their message. And it's so powerful because it's true. This is where discretion matters. What do they actually have? And is that something we really want? We are believers, Muslims, a people with a revealed book and moral precepts and more than 1,400 years of learned dynamic discussion. We have a template. We have a measure. We are equipped to screen all the offers before us and to make the decisions that will put us right. Better still is to remain ignorant of their offers, like the goats before they saw the buckets. We lie comfortably amongst one another, resigned to the moment that we are all in, appreciating that there is nothing for us beyond what God has decreed. As is mentioned in the Quran, chapter 13, verse 28, surely in the remembrance of God do hearts find comfort. You can read a transcript of this recording, get on our mailing list, and learn about upcoming events at our website, www.dustandtribe.com. My name is Ahmed, and this is the Dust and Tribe Podcast.